Hi everybody, welcome to Elementary Classical Mechanics, the subject where observing the universe suggests new mathematical and computational approaches that can literally transform our way of modeling and predicting any aspect of the world. Hi everybody, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be in chapter three. There's a lot of material in chapter three, so let's get started. So we're still in kinematics. We introduced the notion of a space curve in the last chapter, and we're going to go more deeply into their description, talk about circular motion, and then we're going to introduce the subject of line integrals. And there's a lot of mathematics in line integrals. So let's begin. So what we're going to do, recall the picture of a space curve that we had that is a vector valued function of a scalar variable we'll call t. And r of t, we think of r as the position vector emanating from the origin. And as it moves in time, we think of t as time, it traces out a curve. That's our space curve. Now, what we're going to do is derive a coordinate system that's intrinsic to that space curve. So at every point, we're going to derive a coordinate system. What, so what does it mean, derive a coordinate system? At each point, we're going to construct a set of mutually orthogonal unit vectors. So the first unit vector we're going to construct is a unit tangent vector we're going to call uppercase boldface t. And it's going to be the derivative of the space curve with respect to the arc length. Now, we introduced arc length in the last chapter. We're going to get into it more deeply. But why would this vector be tangent to the curve? Well, a more natural definition of tangent is probably the velocity vector, which is by construction tangent, dr dt. Remember that the magnitude of the velocity, 3.2, is defined to be ds dt, and that's a differential equation defining the arc, vector, uh, the arc length. All right, but a natural candidate for a tangent vector, I seem to be going in circles, but I'll get back to it, will be the velocity vector divided by its magnitude. And that's exactly the same as dr ds from the previous page. So here you see that very easily by using a chain rule. And so we see it's unit, dr ds is unit length, it's tangent to the space curve, and that's called uppercase bold t. Now we're going to define an, another vector, n. We're going to call that the principal normal. At, a, at the same point p along the space curve. That's the derivative of the tangent vector that we just constructed divided by its magnitude. So clearly that vector is of unit length, but we need to show that it's perpendicular to t. And that's a little calculation. So we know that t is a unit vector by its very nature, and we differentiate this relation. Remember, we have the product rule for differentiation for dot products. Derivative of 1 is 0, and we get this. So from the definition of t, we can see from this immediately, remember that dot products are commutative. We see that t dot dt ds is 0. And therefore, from the definition of n as dt ds over its magnitude, we see that n dot t is 0. And then for our final, oh, we haven't quite got there yet. We have, we have two um, constants we want to introduce. The magnitude of dt ds we'll call kappa. It's a number. And that's the curvature of the curve at c. And 1 over 
curvature is the radius of curvature. Now, when I first learned this, I didn't have any intuition for this. Why do you call this curvature? Well, develop some intuition by looking at concrete examples. So, a straight line has no curvature, you would guess, and a circle, uniform circle, has curvature that uh, you, you can compute, and you know what the radius of curvature would be. Okay, so in the xy plane, a straight line will just be the x-axis, so y equals 0, the set of xy such as y equals 0, and a circle would be x squared plus y squared equals 1, for example. So, so compute the curvatures and, the and therefore the radius of curvature of each of those and see if it agrees with your intuition. Okay, so with these definitions, n has the form r, radius of curvature, times dt ds, because remember, n was dt ds divided by the magnitude of dt ds. That's our definition of radius of curvature, 1 over that quantity. Now the unit, we need one more vector. We have two unit vectors to find an arbitrary point on the curve, t and n. And so the final vector we call the unit binormal, b. And it's just going to be the cross product of t and n, t cross n. Now it's important that, that we take t cross n because the cross product is not commutative and we the reason we take t cross n, not n cross t, is we want a right-hand coordinate system and you can check that for yourself. Okay, so t, n, and b is this coordinate system that moves along the curve in, in the sense that it's defined at any point along the curve and then we have these scalars, curvature and radius of curvature, that have um, an, an additional characterization of the curve. And if we look back at our picture, we can draw the picture, and this is what we have, and you can check that B is actually T cross N in the right-handed sense. Okay, so what next? Well, we want to differentiate these quantities. Now the velocity, remember, is what? It's t divided by magnitude of t, and that is or t, sorry, t is v velocity, v of t, divided by magnitude, and then we get this relation here. Okay, now we can differentiate this. And using the chain rule, and the fact that uh, ds dt is the velocity, you can check that from the definition of ds dt given earlier. We end, and putting everything together, we end up with this expression, a little more complicated in velocity, for the acceleration. So it has two components. A tangential velocity, tangential component, tangential acceleration, and a component multiplying the normal vector, principle normal, and that's called the normal or centripetal acceleration. All right, now, if we look at the situation of a motion constrained to move, to lie on a circle, a particle that has to be on the circle, its radius cannot vary, in other words, we know what the arc length is, is in that case. The arc length is r times theta, where theta is measured from some, um, some uh, reference point. So if we look at the usual picture that we have, in the plane, a circle of radius r, theta is measured from the horizontal axis, then arc length is r theta, and then we can compute 
these quantities, the velocity and the acceleration. And d theta dt is a quantity, we'll name it omega, that's the angular velocity or angular speed, just a scalar. And alpha, the second derivative of theta with respect to t squared, is the angular acceleration and the normal or centripetal acceleration is given by this term. And we get this just from going back to the more complicated formula and identifying terms that I just derived. Okay, that's enough for now. I have some bullet points in the margin that you'll want to look at that summarize all of these ideas. But the, in the next lecture, we're going to start with deriving a very important coordinate system, polar coordinates in the plane. Sounds a little boring, but there's some interesting wrinkles with respect to vectors there, and it's going to be, play a very important role when we look at central force motion at the end of the course. So bye for now.